So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, someone who's an expert in leading through transformations at the pace of change. Hmm, sounds very familiar. That's what we're talking about here this morning. In fact, he's the leading authority recognized in the area of change and leadership. Dr. Eddie Obang is learning director at Pentacle and a professor at the Henley Business School of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He is on the board of the Design Council, which drives innovation and design national policy for the United Kingdom. He is an author of 10 books. Chris Moras, you got some work to do. You're nine behind. 10 books on delivering results in uncertainty and complexity. Wow, sounds very, very topical. He's also an extremely popular TED presenter at their conferences. Most importantly, Dr. Obang has his feet squarely on the ground of reality. And talking with him this morning, I have no doubt that he's grounded in reality. And he's an incredibly engaging person. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Obang. Thank you. Fantastic. There you go. Thank you. I don't know if you need this. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. Okay, after that introduction from uh, Tony, I think guess the pressure's on. Um, I've got about 30 minutes, and I guess if I was where you are, I'd be thinking, I mean, you heard Tony, you heard Reed. It, it's exciting, isn't it? And I think I would be thinking, that's great. That's fantastic. Now, there are a number of things which I don't understand about this world, and maybe you guys can help me. Okay? I, I just want to do a very quick poll, the old-fashioned way, where you put your hands up. Okay? First question. I want you to tell me whether or not you think innovation is crucial to your organizations, whether being able to drive technology is really important. If you think this is something which should be your lifeblood or really important to your organization, just stick your hand up. So just look around you and look at the number of hands which have gone up. Almost everyone says, brilliant stuff. Now you can put your hands down. Second question. How many of you think that actually there's masses of innovation in our organization, more than we can cope with. I mean, it's tons. I mean, we can barely cope with the amount of innovation. In fact, globally, there's so much innovation. It just pours through our organizations. Hands up. Have another look around. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Do you understand? Everyone's saying we need it, and yet there's none of it about what's going on. But doesn't it bother? Is it just me? Am I the only crazy guy here? So that's the first thing which worries me. I don't understand that. And I think when you start to dig, you realize there must be something else going on. It's not the technology, it's not the innovation. There's someone out there killing it off. <laughs> Is it you guys? <laughs> Okay, so I titled this session, Make It So, because what I wanted to do in 30 minutes is to explore questions I don't understand. That one about innovation and being able to get it to happen is one thing I don't understand. The other one I don't understand, which I'll try and walk you through, is this one here, um, a strange looking thing. If I can find it quickly, I will. Um, what I want to do is take you around this diagram. It's a really simple diagram. It starts over here where it says, uh, oh, I have a massive workload. I don't know whether you can see this one over here. Okay? And because I've got a huge workload, I don't really have time to plan or to do everything I want to do. So uh, I don't realize how much work I'm committed to and I've only done half. Which moves along to, therefore, I end up saying yes more than is realistic. Which means, of course, my workload goes up even more. Give me less time to plan or to do anything. So I come close to deadlines other people I think are important. And because they're bit worried they'll miss their deadlines, guess what? They come and they interrupt me. So I spend a lot of my time restarting half-done jobs, pushing my workload higher. So now they know I'm disorganized. And they send me millions and millions of texts on my, and messages on my smartphone and emails. Have you seen this happening to other people around you? <laughs> How could I know your life before I met you? <laughs> do you understand what it means? It means we're all in the same mess and the mess is bigger than us. And that's what we've got to explore. First, there's someone killing these innovations. And the second is, as smart people, we're doing dumb stuff. And we've got to figure out how to win these two. There's a third thing I don't understand. And when we pull all these three together, maybe we'll be able to work out what we're going to do with our time. Third thing I don't understand, the town I live and work in is a town called Beaconsfield in the UK. And it's in, it, there are some very strange people who live there. I call them time travelers. They live in houses with good internet connections, with really good computers and devices. They can chat with their, their families, their grandkids in uh, South Africa, or whatever they need to do. But yet, every morning, they wake up, put on smart clothes, jump into a car on a train or a bus or something, travel for about 32 minutes to an hour to go to this place called an office. Have you come across these things before? 
And so you'd imagine they've gone all the way to these offices so they can do interesting things like brainstorming together, working with colleagues, I don't know what it is, talking to customers, real dynamic human stuff. But no, they sit in front of another computer. But this one isn't the 21st century computer, it's a 20th century computer. Locked down, no applications, just the basics on there. Can't use YouTube, can't do anything. You with me? Have you seen this? So what do they do? They spend their time emailing each other. They do this thing called email tag. I email you, okay, in the morning you're emailing me, so I didn't read it. Meanwhile, I bump into him, I tell him about it, he emails you, he then emails her, she emails him. And after about 20, 30 emails, we suddenly realize there's lots of stuff going on. No one knows where all of it is. And we say the magic words, we must have a meeting to discuss this. They realize they've traveled to uh, different offices, the people they want to meet to are in different places. So they decide, uh, innovation, we'll do this thing called, I don't know if you've come across, it's called an audio conference. My definition of audio conference is one person talking and 26 people continue to do the emails. <laughs> so what happens is they discuss, no one was listening, no decisions made, no one's captured it, and then they travel back to the 21st century to go to sleep at night. Do you understand that? Okay. So we've got to find a way to get past the people who are killing the innovation. We've got to make absolutely certain we understand that the bits we're missing, we see. Because you must be doing stuff which makes no sense in reality, even though it makes sense to you. And the third is, we've got to get other people to realize that the technology, the pace of change, the number of people have changed how we should live, have changed how we should work have changed where we should work and whom we should work with. And that's my goal. I just want to give you some tools, some ways of moving those things forward. My plan, I now need your plan, okay? So, please, just talk to the person sitting next to you, just for two or three seconds. I want you to chat to them and say what you'd like to get out of the remaining 20 odd minutes. What would really make, your, make it fantastic for you? Your biggest hopes. But I'm actually not interested in those as much as your biggest fears. What is it you're worried about? That we get to the end of the 30 minutes and what's gone wrong? I'm actually more interested in those ones. I'm only giving you 40 seconds. It's a short presentation and the world's changing fast. So just chat, talk to the people around you. Go, your time has started. Now, let's go. About 10 seconds left. There we go. It's not that accurate. Okay. So I put mine up here. My things were things like, oh, something which will help me overcome resistance. I don't know. And same old boring stuff is the other one which I had. And I get dragged onto stage and look stupid in front of my colleagues. So those were my fears. But uh, what we'll try and do is capture some of yours as well. So if you could just tell me, just shout out. We haven't got time for microphones and boring stuff like that. Anything you want or you don't want. I don't give you the silver bullet, so biggest fear is no silver bullet. You leave here without the silver bullet, yeah? And the biggest hope is you get the silver bullet. I think somebody here is confused. <laughs> okay, any others? You just shout from the back as loudly as you can. I'm, I'm very good at it. How to get execs to get behind it, okay? And, and amen to that, okay? Any others? So we build and they don't use it, okay? So how to get them to use it, yeah? How to build and use, yeah? Is that fair? Great, okay. I'm probably too far away from my receiver, okay? And one more fear. The fears are the ones I'm really interested in. So we discover that we're doomed. <laughs> Is that it? Cool, okay, great. So 
what we've got there is we've got a number of different things. I guess the first question I want to ask you is, well, I should have made that miserable, is why am I asking your hopes and fears? I'm supposed to be a professor in this stuff. I should just come on here and say, right, change. The key elements of change, I put the first PowerPoint up. Ensure you engage people and make sure they have some sort of reason to move and some burning platform. That's what I should do, surely. Why would I even waste any 40 seconds of your time getting you to talk to each other and telling each other your hopes and fears? What's that about? Sorry? Establishing rapport. I'm a professor. I should know this stuff. I should have done the research on rapport. Rapport should say I should use rhetorical questions like, what do you think? If I were you, I would think this. And I just, I don't need to establish rapport, surely. <laughs> okay, let me let you in on the secret. The problem is you're all human beings. Do you understand how bad this is? Look, human beings are awful animals. We're not designed for change at all. Not even small little change. I, I know you're thinking you like change. Yeah, but you like the change you do. Do you like the change other people do to you? <laughs> do you understand? Let me explain to you what happened. Four and a half million years ago, what used to happen was, if you went to Jive, um, Jive, Jive World four and a half million years ago, they, they did have them, they, you didn't find people with sophisticated job descriptions like CIO and business development. No, they only had two job descriptions, which were what? Hunters and gatherers, that was it, okay? Hunters and gatherers, that was what they did. Okay, now if you're a hunter and a gatherer, okay, and you go out hunting, do you just say goodbye to your other, your other half and say, goodbye, darling, where are you going? I'm going hunting and gathering. And they let you go and say goodbye, or do they give you a massive hug? Massive hug, why? Because all the other animals have exactly the same strategy, and they're better animals than you. You know, you say both fastest man on the planet can run at 26 miles an hour. Fastest man on the planet, the average rabbit can do 32 miles an hour. <laughs> your cat's got claws, your dog's got jaws, you're a rubbish animal. So if you went out hunting and gathering, there's a high probability you would be hunted and gathered by something else. <laughs> but we're here, we're at the top of the, 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 the food chain. How could that happen? It's not possible, we're rubbish animals. When you watch Discovery Channel, they'll tell you things like, mankind made tools and use these tools for, have you come across this one before? And they'll tell you things like, and also, that's supposed to be a toolbox, by the way, and also, mankind, in its evolution, used his big brain to think of clever things and come up with ideas and used good communication. Have you come across this stuff before? And you, you believe all this nonsense, okay? And then they'll say things like, and also, we also work together in teams. By helping each other to harvest and hunt, we could... I'm using the right voice, am I? And finally, somebody will say, and with our... You know when other animals have to eat, it's very unstylish to put their face in the food? We can use chopsticks and cutlery because we've got thumbs. Have you come across this? Okay, so this is what they'll tell you is the truth. This is complete nonsense. This is not why mankind got to the top. The real thing which kept us alive is nothing to do with those. If you don't believe me, just think about it for a second, okay? We're all out hunting and gathering together. Hunting and gathering, as one does, okay? All of a sudden, out of the bushes bursts a saber-toothed tiger with teeth, you know the ones, okay? Bouncing towards you. And as he bounces towards you, you stick out your thumb and say, stop! Forget that one? Okay, so as he's bounding towards you, you switch on your big brain and start to think, what is it I learned on Discovery Channel? What's the key strategic objectives? And how can we use this platform? And as you start to do that, what's going to happen? You're going to get eaten. Forget that one. So, tools. There were only four tools in those days. They were called big stone, little stone, big stick, little stick. Forget that one. So it must be teamwork. All of us as one, as one team, one big community. The jive community out hunting and gathering together, chanting the hunter gatherer chant of hunt, gather, hunt. Oh, come on, I can't be a team by myself. You've got to join in. Bit of passion. We're chanting hunt, gather, hunt. Oh, come on, I can see you're not chanting. Come on, let's go, let's go. Hunt, gather, hunt. Yes, the jive community team. Wow. Okay, bad news. Are there other animals who are also hunting teams? For example, lions, tigers, hyenas, and saber two tigers. So 1,500 of us. And we meet 1,500 hungry saber two tigers. What's the halftime score? <laughs> the thing which keeps you alive has got nothing to do with that. It's actually a little piece of software which lives in the back of your neck about here. That software stops you being eaten. Basically, what it does is it checks day and night. Is everything the same? The answer is yes. It says relax. Is everything the same? Yes, relax. Then it notices a twig cracking or bird flying. Instantly, that software does three fast things. First, most important thing it does, it goes, oh my God, something has changed close to me. I'm a human being, a rubbish animal. Any change close to me is a potential threat to my security. Plus, I'm a human being, a rubbish animal. I'm getting away with it. I built habits so I get away with it really easily. So I really don't want to do this. Not only is it a threat, it's actually a threat to my continued existence. And then it does something else. 
once it's decided it's a threat, it takes your big modern brain, that bit there, and it switches the logic bits off. Why? Because thinking is always going to be too slow, isn't it? And then it does something else. It makes you really, 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 really scared. Why does it make you really, really scared? <laughs> because you're in the moment. When you're scared, you're here. I've never seen somebody go, I can do this so much in seconds. I've got a meeting at four. Nobody does that. <laughs> so at that point, it then fills you full of adrenaline, drugs, OK? And then you start to do your fighting and your fleeing. And if you're not eaten, then the drug level comes down. The fear level comes down. If you're lucky, the brain switches back on. And then you have your discussions and ideas. Why am I telling you this? Because all your colleagues at work have exactly the software in their neck. So when you go back to them and you say, hey, I found some really good integrated software, you might as well just be saying, I've got a saber tooth tiger coming at you. <laughs> their brains switch off. But you see, you're intelligent people. You're logical, and you're not very attentive. When their brains switch off, you don't notice, because they no longer leap up and run out of the room in fear. They sit there. Are you with me? And their stomachs are tight, and they sweat on their brows. And you think they're still listening to you. I, I, yeah, so you continue to talk using logic, explaining the benefits. This is really cool. We'll turn off multiple systems. We'll align all our... So you're telling them all this stuff. But they're just hearing noise, because their brains are off. Ooh, that's all they're hearing. Have you ever been on the other side of that? Where somebody has surprised you in a meeting and you know how you can normally talk, but all of a sudden you can't think what to say? Has this happened to you before? And you talk anyway and rubbish comes out of your mouth. Well, one must consider the alignment. It's nonsense, okay? You leave the meeting, you go home, you chill, you have a beer, and then suddenly you go, damn, what I should have said to them was. Same process the other way around. And once they go emotional, now you're in big trouble. Can logic ever connect with emotion? Of course not. Try this at home. Next time your other half says, you don't really love me. Say yes, I do. And prove logically that you do. I brought you breakfast and see what happens. <laughs> no, you give them a hug. The only thing which beats emotion is that another emotion. Basically, that's how you connect with people. If they're scared, you use emotion. But I would suggest don't get them scared in the first place. The reason I asked you your hopes and fears was because I wanted you to come on this journey with me. I was using something which is also 4 million years old, which is another piece of software higher in your brain. It's a very, very important thing because it's down here in the old crocodile bit. You can't control it. When somebody asks you a question and you start to answer, do you know what happens to you? Basically, the brain burns energy faster than muscle, 10 times faster than muscle. So to survive as a human with huge brain, you have to use every calorie. Have you ever seen a hunter-gatherer who's sort of happy and jolly? No, they always stick thin. Why? because they use all their calories. So this is like a policeman. The moment you get a question of any sort and your brain starts to burn energy, it says, hey, brain, you're burning energy. I want you first to fall in love with that idea. Have you noticed how much wonderful all your own ideas are? You do fall in love with them. And turn it into more food. You with me? And that's what a question does. By restructuring how you connect with people, by bringing it in as stimuli, by letting them work it out for themselves, by posing a question and then enabling them to answer it, you bypass the old crocodile brain. That's why I asked your hopes and fears. And the fears in particular, the fears are crucial. When I was looking for your fears, I only got one or, one or two of them. It's not enough. Look, all the textbooks will tell you that as a leader, which you guys are, you're trying to transform the business, aren't you? You're bringing this new stuff in. But as a leader, they tell you, you must be motivational and energetic and make people move forward fast, faster and further. You know what I mean? Show passion. And they tell you these things in books. It's not true. Stop and think about it. In the UK, we have this thing called charity parachute jumps. Basically, the idea is you get in a plane, which works. You go up. You put in a parachute. You jump out. If you land and you're not dead, then everyone gives money to charity. That's basically the idea. So imagine I persuaded you to go on a, one of these charitable jump thingies. Okay? And we're in the plane going up 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet. We're getting higher and higher. All of a sudden, we're coming towards 3,000 feet. And I turn into the inspirational leader and say, we believe in this charity, don't we? We're going to transform the lives of these vulnerable people. Let's forget these parachutes and jump just to show how much we care. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> of course not. The way you get people to move fast through change is you reduce the level of fear. You try and make it less scary. You try and make it as familiar as possible. In fact, you do something which we people in tech hate doing. You pretend it's not really cool. <laughs> if you tell them it's cool, it's the saber-tooth tiger, they're scared out of their wits. 
Do you understand? Okay. So that's what we have to start to do. Shift how we engage with people. And at this point, I have to stop because I've thrown a lot of ideas about you, about people in particular. So hopefully, we're going to start thinking about engaging with people differently, asking them questions, using the questions to drive the behaviors, and so on. I'm going to stop. I'm going to give you just 20 seconds to talk to each other and say, what did that guy say? Do I need to make some notes? Yes, he said something about saber two tigers. I'll write that down. 20 seconds, and then we move on. Okay, over to you. Chat to the people who you've not spoken to before, the ones behind you. Go. 20 seconds. It started. Go. Okay. So for me, the biggest challenge in making change work is the human beings. If you can fix that bit, everything else starts getting much easier. It really is. And remember, don't scare them wherever possible. Find out what's bugging them. I like that uh, application uh, on, on Jive, that way you could see the people who are negative about the email you sent out. Those people for me would be my gold dust. Absolutely my gold dust. Why? Because when you're looking at people, what you'll discover is that there's some people who understand what you're talking about. Can you imagine that? So I'll put a yes here and a no here. And there's some people who actually agree with what you're doing. Can you imagine that? And I'll put here a yes here and a no here. How would you describe somebody who understands what you're trying to do and agrees with you? A friend. Fantastic. Somebody who's on your side. An ally. I wrote that in yellow. That should have been in black. Ally. Friend. Any others? Advocate, fantastic. These are all good, positive, positive ways of describing people. How would you describe somebody who understands what you're trying to do, but doesn't agree with you? Stupid, fantastic. I love that. Okay, great. How would you describe somebody who doesn't understand what you're trying to do and doesn't agree with you? Even more ignorant, an idiot. Okay, fantastic. And finally, somebody who understands what you're trying, sorry, doesn't understand what you're trying to do, but agrees with you anyway. <laughs> That's your staff. That's the consultant you hired. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, now this is where it all falls apart. Because you're all good, decent people. So who do you spend your time with? Well, guess what? You spend your time with good, sensible people like you, which is a complete and utter waste of time. These are the people you need to connect with. Do you understand why I like that tool? Because it tells me I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to have lunch with the stupid, ignorant, idiotic. They're the ones you need to move. You with me? The others are fine. When you're serious about driving change, you focus on the people. Now let's move on to the change itself. The real headache with the change is two things have happened to it. One, the organizations we've designed are designed to kill it. And the second is we think about it the wrong way. Organizations, you don't believe me, are designed to kill it. Look, let me just walk you through something. When I've got plenty of time and I've got time to explain things to people, I try and explain that basically over the past 30 years, somebody has done something weird to us. If this is now and that's the past, they've accelerated the pace of change. They've connected everyone together you guys including, with things like Jive, and at the same time, they made sure that we interact more. Net result, the pace of the world is doing this quite happily. Not the interesting part. The interesting part is how we're learning and changing to match. Basically, usually we're limited by what our organization says the strategy is, or how often we have our meetings, i.e. flat. In other words, those two lines cross, cross over. Now, this is where it all gets interesting, because once they cross over, everything breaks. I used to work for a company called Shell, big oil company, once upon a time. Basically, they run their business like many people run their businesses today. Big, great, complex hierarchies. Why? Because if you can learn fast than the world is changing, and you're smart, you put the cleverest person or the most experienced person in charge, they tell everyone else what to do, they tell everyone else what to do, and you build a beautiful machine which looks just like that. Young people come in where? At the bottom, you tell them a lie, which is, one day you'll be at the top, why is it a lie? Because you're there and you're not going anywhere. So, 
They should catch you out, but they don't catch you out because next year you get growth, more younger people come in below, all of a sudden they get their own little department, they go home and celebrate. And everyone's happy with this. No one realizes. Yeah? But this system is designed to keep people apart. You group them by their skills, remember. You keep them apart. You set them different targets and budgets. So over here, there's a chap called Bill. And Bill meets a customer and realizes the customer wants a different platform, which is integrated in a certain way. I don't know what it is, but he does it. Well done, Bill. Bad news. It impacts on the department which Bob is involved in. So Bob is now completely pissed off. So what does Bob do? He, he calls who? Bill? No, he doesn't call Bill. Who does he call? Bill's boss? No. He calls his own boss. Is that right? You complain to your line? Is that right? Am I right? It makes no sense. So you've annoyed me, and I go and say, look, they've annoyed me. But that's how it's designed. Why? Because 400 years ago, at sea, the Navy and the British Navy used to have these ships with ropes. And when you're running a, a ship with lots of ropes, you have a problem. The problem is very simple. Basically, if you move the ropes, they'll get tangled. So when the captain wants to move the ropes, he issues an order. He says, lash the yard arm to crew Kringle. First officer hears the message, lash the yard arm. It goes all the way down the chain to the guy who's going to knot the rope. He knots the rope. He has to report back so they can move the next rope. You got it? So he says, yard arms, lash yard arm. Goes all the way back to the captain who says, says hoist the mainsail. They didn't have jive. They didn't have mobile phones in those days. You with me? Great. Good stuff. That's the organizations we've designed. So basically, Bob goes to his boss who goes up and up and up till it comes to the guy at the top, probably you. You've been called from the spar of the golf course. You do something amazing. You knock your two direct heads together. Two bolts of lightning come down. One's up Bob, one's up Bill. What does Bob learn from this? Don't complain. They're all crazy just to what they ask you to do. What does Bill learn? Don't innovate. Don't do anything different. Wait for an opportunity to get the revenge on that bastard Bob who got into trouble. Now, why is that important? Because he keeps the status. And that allows you to do more of the same and gives you good growth. But unfortunately, we live in a world where we don't just want linear growth. We need innovative growth. So when you come to deliver your change, you'll see there's a problem. And the problem is this. Everyone is trying to protect this structure. If you frighten them, they'll fight harder. But don't worry, that's why I told you about the people before. Don't worry, that's why I mentioned the fact they were trying to do it, because you can bring them in as allies. But now it's over to you. How do you deliver the change? You see, most of us were brought up in this old world where when you were going to deliver change, you knew exactly what you were going to do and how you were going to do it in detail. Is that how it is for you? Or are you making it up as you go along? Correct. So how do you deliver change when you're making it up as you go along? Three things. First thing, you treat it as if you were lost in the fog. In other words, when you're lost in the fog, you cannot describe the outcome in real detail, so you describe all the problems people have, but use the opposite. It's slow, it's not helping, it's expensive. And they'll nod and agree because they recognize the problems. So that's the first thing to do. Then you can get some traction. I often use a technique called the gap leap, which is a very quick way of making a business case and telling a story. And uh, I'll try and find that for you and just try and explain it really quickly. So um, what I'll often do is in advance, I'll quite quickly um, put together, I'll, I'll do it. There you go. I'll make, it, I'll make it live for you. So here's, here's my gap leap. Um, if you want to do it, I'll show you how to do it later. But here in the middle it says, we can't move our organization uh, faster than um, we need to take advantage of the world around us. But if we don't fix that, what will happen to us? Well, we are individually will get very frustrated. Our businesses will underperform. Customers will be fed up. Uh, key employees will disappear. Uh, competitors will take all our lunch. Miserable, isn't it? Did I get your attention? Well, what happens if we could fix it? Well, if we could fix it, then what we probably discover is that uh, we've got new opportunities and other stuff, and at the end of the day, I feel absolutely great. Now, why would I want to construct this? Because this is like a mini business case story. I can tell somebody this story as my vision of the fog. So why haven't we done it yet? Well, I didn't really network when I came to Jive 2013. Uh, I keep uh, trying to do everything myself instead of using other people and other experts. I fell asleep during Eddie's session, and uh, I didn't know enough how to do it. So I'm just putting that together. It's a very simple process. But now it gives you all the language. You can go to somebody with the problems and start to describe the opposite. 
And if you're really, really into it, you can then say, well, if we do nothing over the next year, it's going to cost us X number of millions. And if we could do something, we'd gain X number of millions. And look, all I'm asking us to do is X, Y, Z. It makes a conversation. It's not frightening. People can move forward with it. So that's one really crucial thing. The second thing which you need to work on is yourselves. The reality is you're going to have to be in it for the long haul. What do I mean by long haul? It means resilience. I run marathons, okay? When, you, when I was learning how to run marathons, the other runners around me used to do this funny thing. We'd run for a while, and they'd get these plastic tubes, and they'd squeeze stuff into their mouths. And it looked disgusting. So I wouldn't do it. I said, I'm not having any of those horrible gel things, okay? And then after about 10 miles, I would sort of fall over. And they'd say, you didn't manage your nutrition. You should have paced yourself and had your hydration and your nutrition. And that's what you need to do. If you're going to implement something on this scale, Two tricks. You have to realize you won't do it very quickly, so you have to pace yourself. You have to find times when you re-energize, when you meet up with other people, when you have a break. Other thing around you, try to build fractal structures. So infect about 10 people and encourage them to infect another 10 people. That way you can get to hundreds of thousands of people really fast. If you try and do it all yourself, you will simply burn out. Then the third thing which you need to do if you're going to try and make big change work is you always, always, always need to be the embodiment. You need to make sure that you're part of what's seen as the change, but not all the time. In complex organizations, it's also crucial to do what we call invisible leadership. What's invisible leadership? It means giving away credit for some of the good stuff to people who didn't do anything. Why would you do that? Because we know they're trying to kill it, and if you made them look good, it makes it harder for them to kill it. <laughs> you got it. So those are the three I'll share with you. And as we round up, I'm just going to give you another 30 seconds, or actually 10 seconds, talk to your colleagues, capture the one thing you learned, and then I'll wrap it all up, and then we call it a day. So just talk, I got this. I didn't get anything. I, I think it was yes, the, the, that story about the saber tooths. Just th 10 seconds. Just capture your key learning, and then we wrap up. Okay, I need to pull the threads. I want to, um, everyone captured something? I just want to leave you with a story. It has nothing to do with what I've been trying to help you to learn, but it is good fun. I wrote it when I was at Ashridge many years ago, and it's become quite popular, and it's a nice story. It's a story about the five monkeys. If you've never heard it before, I shall tell you this story because I hope you'll enjoy it. But it's about change and how organizations get stuck in change. Very simple experiment. They've got five monkeys. They built a cage, nice humane cage. They put a stepladder in the cage, and they hung a couple of bananas from the ceiling. And the experiment is watched as these monkeys spotted these bananas. What do you think happened? They went, monkeys, bananas. They started to climb the stepladder to get to the, the bananas. I wish one of the lead experimenter took a hose with really cold water, hosed the lead monkey, and then all the others for good measure. So they're cold, sitting in the corner, shivering. Okay? After a while, one of them warmed up, started to go for the banana, same thing, hosed him, and hosed all the ones who hadn't even moved. You with me? So, of course, by now they're sitting there, and next one starts to warm up. He starts to go, all of the others jump on him and beat him up. Why? Because they don't want to get wet, okay? Because they know doing stuff which is new gets wet, okay? At which point they take one of these monkeys out and introduce a brand new monkey. New monkey comes in, sees the banana, opportunity, sees the other stupid monkeys, goes, I'm going for it. So he starts to climb for the banana. They all jump on him and beat him up. So he's sitting in the corner all beaten up. He doesn't know why. They take out another one of the original monkeys, bring in another new monkey. Next new monkey comes in, looks, crazy monkeys, starts to climb. They all jump on him and beat him up, including the other new monkey who joins in enthusiastically, even though he doesn't know why. <laughs> Apparently they can take the monkeys out. Third monkey gets a beating from two of them. Fourth one, the fifth one, really badly beaten. And they all sit there staring at this wonderful opportunity. And if you were to say to them, look, this is the way the world's working. New platforms, new opportunities, using data in a different way. Why don't you just do it? Look, oh, Eddie, you don't understand. That's the way we do things around here. Thank you very much. <laughs>